Okay, hello to the third presentation today. I'm going to talk about Pitchfork, Project Pitchfork. The plan was actually to have ready working pitchforks here at the camp already. But unfortunately, as you will see during this presentation, I underestimated the difficulties of uh, designing and producing hardware and overestimated my own competences. Um, but I think maybe with more time and more effort, I can um, remedy that, these limits that I have. So the logo of Project Pitchfork is actually the logo of Noisy Square from uh, 30C3, uh, German Congress. Um, they were kind enough to actually already advertise Project Pitchfork back at the 33C3 uh, because I'm working on this project for, I guess, more than two years now. So what is Project Pitchfork? Pro project Pitchfork is a hardware device that operates over USB and uh, provides cryptographic uh, functions and key compartmentalization. Key compartmentalization means that the cryptographic keys are stored in the device and never leave that. So whenever you want to do any cryptographic operation with a key, you give this device the data that you want to operate on, the data gets processed with the cryptographic key and then it gets emitted again and then you have the end result of the processing. So, and, then, and this means that the cryptographic key is never on your laptop or on your PC, so it's kind of like a, a very cheap hardware uh, security module. Um, and I've been working on this for two years, or more than two years. The first inspiration of that was for, for the pitchfork was the, the rocket from the camp uh, four years ago, um, which the CCC organized, and they gave out these badges, and they have a lot of very exciting hardware features. They have a radio, um, they have input buttons, it has a display, and you can even put an SD card on it if you, if you want to solder a bit more. So this is very exciting. So um, can, I was thinking about uh, to myself, like, can I run some serious crypto on this? And since Daniel Bernstein put out his uh, NACL, pronounced SALT, library, um, which is very minimalistic and should work also, I guess, on these 32-bit uh, LPC systems. I was thinking, let's try that out. It turned out I can do elliptic curve cryptography on here, but I don't have enough RAM. Um, and it's a bit slowish, but it's okay, I guess. So um, this was the inspiration, but the hardware was not sufficient for that. So I thought, let's uh, design a new device with a bigger uh, chip in there, but the chip shouldn't be really big, just only more memory and more, maybe more processing power, but not more peripherals that I don't use uh, or will not use. So, <clears throat> and then I bought myself uh, this development board. This is an ARM STM32F205, um, which is um, basically a bigger brother of the CPU than was in the rocket. And uh, I developed basically the firmware for the pitchfork already on this device. And I can, I can basically do all the cryptographic operations you will expect to do, like signing, verification, encryption, decryption. It can also spit out uh, random numbers at about one megabyte per second and um, it can do other nifty stuff. For example, I have implemented a USB mass storage interface for this, so I can actually use this as a, as a mass storage, USB uh, storage device, like a USB stick, right? Uh, the funny thing is, since I implemented the firmware for this, I can, I can satisfy my own requirements that seemingly the industry has never heard of. For example, having two different LEDs for writing and reading operations. I really like that. And also having something that is read-only. 
And this I can control by compiling a firmware that has no write operations implemented, right? So, so I can pretty much guarantee that this is a read-only device. Also, since I tried and I, I, ma I managed to get some crypto running on there, of course I can also intercept the packets in, in, in transit and can uh, store encrypted data to the micro SD card that I attach to this device. Um, this, of course, only works with FATFS or any other file system that uh, uh, that I implement, but currently I only implemented this in FATFS because um, the cryptographic operations uh, add some extra data and if you want to do this on a block level, you cannot do because uh, the storage device has a block size of 512 bytes and I need to add 48 bytes more, but the block has no more bytes, so either I allocate extra data somewhere on the, on, on the storage or uh, I don't know how to handle transparently encryption and decryption of blocks without uh, somewhere storing this additional nonsense and uh, yes, and uh, max. So this is this is kind of this is this doesn't work quite well. But if you do this on, for example, with a, 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 a file system like FAT, then it works pretty well. So there's a lot of other exciting possibilities that you can implement here. I am really, I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to have this implemented also in real hardware, not only on this development board, because then I can uh, continue on really on the development of, of the cryptographic features. Uh, but currently, the last few months have been, or maybe even years have been spent with developing the hardware. So this is the pitchfork. Uh, as I said, this is a status update and the pitchfork is still under construction. And uh, how much uh, how, the stuff that failed with the pitchfork, for example, is this is the display. Actually, it should have 128 by 46 pixels, but as you can see, only every second uh, row is displayed because the display is broken. So this doesn't de debugging this didn't help much. <laughs> Why is it not displaying stuff that I the way I like? So and then the next thing is I ordered the final or the first PCB. And uh, as you can see, they did uh, the manufacturer did testing. So what the PCBs that didn't work were crossed out, and I got replacements for those. So I, I got my full order. Um, but it turns out um, the PCB has some problems because I I guess I made some for errors in the design. But these can be easily corrected. One of the problems that you can maybe see here. Uh, this should be a ground plate and not uh, isolated. So this should be like silverish, like here and here also. So these are three boards actually, uh, if you cut them here. So I have them here as well. So if you want to hold them in your hand and have a look, you can have. Um, and then when I got the board, it took some time until I found a way to apply the solder paste because I forgot to order stencil for for applying the solder paste to the PCB. But after some deliberations, I went to Vienna into Metalab, who has a, who have a very nice uh, industrial laser cutter, and they helped me in cutting the stencil. And even the industrial laser cutter was unable to to cut some of the, the pins for the CPU, unfortunately. But in the end, it succeeded pretty well. And um, this is right after baking uh, the, the board, um, the very first board that I produced. And after attaching all the rest of the, the uh, parts that were missing, uh, this is how the board looks like. In the lower part of the picture, you can see this is the OLED display that is at a, that is that, that is the display of of the pitchfork. This needs to be bent back, of course, like this. Okay. Uh, what you can see here is, of course, the uh, micro SD card slot. You can see the USB car uh, USB um, port. You can see the ETA, uh, the the network power switch. So this uh, physically disconnects uh, the network device this, uh, this is the network uh, CP chip, and this is uh, disconnected through this switch, so you can be sure that it cannot transmit anything if you don't want it, for example, cryptographic keys. 
and this is the main power switch. Uh, what you can see up here are first of all four buttons that you can use as input. The idea is to have input of passwords in a way like if you, if any of you have played Guitar Hero or guitars, you know how to push multiple buttons at the same time and even do like rhythm stuff and chording, right? So this is the way you input your password on this device because it has such a limited uh, size. But the nice thing about this, this technique is you can do that in your pocket. If you really, it's like you, you learn one guitar song and you play that and no one can really have a look at it if you open the device in your pocket, for example. Uh, so this is how you uh, how the input is done. Here you see a JTAG or SV, SWD uh, pins. So you can this is the developer version, of course. So this is where you can still uh, develop. So these pins are live. Uh, there's a battery connected to be uh, that you can connect here. I don't know what else is interesting here. So this is this is the device as it is assembled, but not in a in a package yet. So hmm. I told you I kind of overestimated my competences, and yes, um, I showed you already some p uh, problems, but then uh, some other problems had to be fixed. Uh, this is a, a magnification, you can see it on this device uh, in small, uh, in real. Uh, this, is, this is a beautiful patching of me uh, misaligning four pins. Uh, I thought that this pin and this pin should be connected, so like this pin should be connected here and the second pin should be connected here, but instead actually this pin should be connected here and not here, so it had to be routed around and actually this other pin, these two, had to be connected to, to ground and that is the patching that you can see here. This has not been done by me, this has been done by a good friend of mine in Vienna called Vic. He's are uh, very talented in, in these kind of stuff. Um, big thanks to you. Um, so, and then after fixing all this stuff, it turns out that from the power uh, DC-DC converter that converts down the power from 4.2 volts to 3.3 volts, uh, it doesn't look very good. I don't know how much you, how well you can see this, this curve, but this should be like around 3.3 and uh, the scope says 3.7 or the highest is 3.6 and it looks wiggly so I don't know if this uh, this is not very convincing so what we did uh, the power supply output something that we don't like so you cut off the power supply and instead uh, connect a laboratory uh, power supply and check out if you can control very precisely uh, the power then you 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 can test uh, how things work out um, then it turns out that it doesn't matter at all what you're doing. So where you cut off the power supply, you can see the cut is this here. Uh, it turns out that everything is okay. So it has been soldered back and this is done by Roland. And you can see also this, you should all see this in real, how small this is, because you will not see how. And this has been done uh, without a microscope and free-handed uh, soldering with a soldering iron not anything this is this is really impressive so without the help of these people i would be even much more behind schedule than i am already ah the bug is back um, so and then to make things even worse uh, i was kind of like okay this all doesn't work but at least if i plug it in via usb then it will be detected by my CPU and my operating system and I will see something in the syslog. So I plug this in and instead of anything happening um, in my syslog, instead uh, my laptop shut down and I was unable to shut it on again. And it turned out that it somehow uh, burned uh, a power uh, chip that is uh, switching the power for these two USB ports that I have. Um, and it created a short circuit and when you switch on the laptop, this one here, it turns out that, ah, there's a shortcut I'm not switching on myself, so you cannot switch it on. So first the burn uh, part had to be removed. Uh, luckily, um, the burn part is available on Farnell um, for two and a half euros. Um, and Farnell, so like, I guess for, for the price of 10 euros or something, they shipped me the spare parts within 
a day, I guess, if everything would have been going well, but instead I missed the postman and so I had to wait through the weekend. Uh, so this this project seems to be a bit of damned. Um, so, but this is this is where I am now. I have um, this this device that I call the USB stick of death. So if anyone doesn't behave, I stick it in his USB port and it will burn the device, or at least the USB port. And if you cannot solder out the burnt part, then you will not be able to use your laptop. <laughs> um, so, and then uh, we created a second board where we only put on the CPU um, and some capacitors. And so we're now going component by component, debugging, putting power on, seeing what is coming out. And if stuff works, then we put on the next component and we build it uh, component by component or board by hand. We're not baking this anymore. <clears throat> so these are, uh, should I, I will show you these after the talk. If you're interested, this is really like the small fixes and patches are really, really, really and ex, um, um, impressive to see. Uh, but I want to also show you something more positive about this project. One, two things I want to show that are offspring of this project. One has been presented last year. This is a, a video cap of the, of the presentation of last year. You can see the Camp HSPB logo in, from the video. This is Pi RSP. It is a, is a, um, a scripting tool with which you can debug ARM CPUs via JTAG and SV, SWD, and it allows you to script uh, tests on the hardware. You can do a kind of like fuzzing as well, or unique testing, etc., etc. If you're interested in uh, Pi RSP, have a look at the talk from last year. It's only 10 minutes long. It's a lightning talk. Um, but it's a really exciting uh, little tool to script if you if you work with with embedded ARM CPUs, um, I can really recommend it. I, it makes life and development with Pitchfork much easier. So, but the other thing that is an offspring of the project Pitchfork is that we also want to kind of allow the people who use Pitchfork to actually produce the device themselves at home, because this way you can kind of like at least. Um, verify the, the supply chain and, and verify that the parts that are in there to some degree can be more trusted than something that has been assembled in China or somewhere and has been shipped to you. But of course in this case you cannot verify the CPU or anything else, but at least you can assemble the thing yourself and you, you can buy the parts in, in some store and um, maybe you can uh, assure yourself that these parts are less compromised than if you would order them somewhere online. So we built uh, this reflow oven controller, the code for the, and, and also the, the design for the reflow oven. We call it the Reflow Master 2000 Plus Deluxe Pro, by the way. Um, um, is available on, on GitHub on this address, uh, on our Hackerspace account. Um, it contains the, the, uh, the keycard designs for the board, which I will show you in a minute. And um, well, basically, this is, this is the first setup that we tested. And here you can see the glowing of the toaster that is going to bake the PCBs. And actually, this toaster and this setup was, 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 was baking this PCB. You can have a look at it. It's pretty well done. So, and how does a reflow oven work? Where the solder paste has like a heat curve that it needs to follow to have the perfect uh, bonding effect. And in this case, the spec defined some kind of curve, which we mapped in blue, as you can see here. And then we started the reflow oven, like the first or second time. And you can see this is degrees and this is like seconds in time. And you can see that the difference in degrees, the red line is what we measured and the blue line is what it should have been. And if you see here, this is within one degree of, of precision. And this is very exciting. We didn't need that at all. Like the, the thresholds are like 30 degrees and, and 10 to 15 seconds of, of thresholds in every direction. Uh, I, I guess maybe you can see it here. It says 155 to 185 degrees and then 
there was 30 to like 120 seconds or something. So these are the thresholds and we were much, much, much closer to that. So this is the curve uh, done by a, a guy in the space who's called Baldi. And this is one of the almost latest designs for the, for the board, uh, for the reflow um, controller that we built. Uh, the size of it is like five, uh, uh, 4.6 uh, centimeters by 2.4 centimeters. Um, next week we're going to order a batch of these. That means we will have about 80 of these boards for in total $30 with postage cost. So this is extremely cheap from China. And I hope to dispense some of them at the big camp in Germany because uh, this is, I think, uh, SMD soldering and baking of stuff should be part of, of many more uh, spaces. And this is a cheap way to distribute that. The code, the software, and everything else is, is available. So this is one of the offspring, and this is one of the things that actually works in, in Project Pitchfork, um, because probably, oh, no, but so Project Pitchfork also has been helped by other people, so. So, and then for the future, it's not about well, first fixing things and making them work, of course, but then for, uh, for the, um, uh, how, how you can package this whole stuff, one of the ideas I had was to put it in, the, uh, in a smartwatch. And smartwatches are actually pretty cool for this, uh, for this format. The only problem with the Pebble smartwatch, I got a Pebble smartwatch for testing this out, is that the Pebble smartwatch doesn't have a SD card slot and the other problem is uh, the input it does have four buttons but it's much harder to input any kind of password like longish sequence this is the th second problem and then the third problem is there's only one way to communicate with this device and that is over bluetooth and i don't really want to send anything over bluetooth that is sensitive in either way really so the Pebble itself is not a good hardware device, but I think if we go to Shenzhen and talk to some Chinese people, they might be able to produce something that we mm, prefer better to this to the smartwatch. The other device uh, format that I like is uh, an old uh, phone, dumb phone. The dumb phones are cool because they have a display, they have a good uh, keyboard, they have place for a battery, so everything would fit in very well. So this is an alternative format and also it doesn't attract very much attention. Like a, a, a clock or a watch, uh, 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 a phone format would not attract much attention as a cryptographic device, right? So this, this would be another option for how to package this. But my, yes please? Of the question was if it's also uh, working as a phone itself. I think yes, that would be even more awesome, but you need a lot of place for the pitchfork is not very small as it is now. So you need a, at least a bigger case from the for, for the phone, but you might still be able to operate it, yes. That would be a really cool idea. But for, for my taste, actually I like these two formats a lot, but my favorite format is this one. Because this you can take into the sauna with you. Uh, <coughs> uh, it's uh, waterproof. Uh, the, the only problem with this is if you need to destroy it in, in a hurry, um, you might have some problems with that. Um, <coughs> so these are the these are my my plans for the um, format. And then I have a very ugly slide. Apparently, uh, there's a new uh, device coming out at the camp, uh, the big camp, uh, the badge. And the batch has a CPU that I'm very excited about. Uh, it is the LPC4370, and it has two USB 2.0 uh, USB ports. And they both have DMA, and so you can operate and implement a USB firewall on this. And actually replacing the CPU that I use now, the STM, into such an LPC, uh, is something that I consider consider for one of the uh, more closer uh, adjustments or developments with the pitchfork when it finally starts running actually with this old design. Uh, but this is something I'm very excited about. So, and then to give you also a little bit of an idea about IaaS exists on the market because I think there's a lot of exciting uh, competition here. Uh, this is my last section. Um, there's a, there's a few devices that I like 
and also like to use myself, but they, they are not as open or hackable as the pitchfork and they have other use cases and other goals, I guess, than, than the pitchfork itself. So the first one that I want, that I, that I kind of like is the YubiKey Neo, which can do open PGP operations in a smart card. So it basically does similar stuff to what the pitchfork does. It can sign, verify, encrypt, and decrypt. Uh, and it can do a few of other things. It can do that via USB. It can do that via near field communications. Um, so this is a pretty exciting device, but it's very much closed. And the, the worst thing about this is, uh, and also it's a good thing uh, in one hand, and on the other hand it's not so good, it's, it's, it's a smart card based device. So you have to code the lowest level in some kind of NDA and crust Java, I don't know what the, the language, uh, it's some kind of Java that is running on here and you really don't want to do that and it's also NDA encrusted so so it's not a really nice thing to develop on but maybe around so if you have this you can develop a lot of fun stuff with on your computer without touching the firmware um, the next one is the crypto stick is very similar to the yubikey neo but it doesn't do the near field communication um, otherwise um, it is a pretty cool device especially if you buy it with the bigger uh, smart card so they can handle 3072 bit keys, uh, three of them. Um, I, I own some of them myself and I really like them. I wouldn't leave home without them. Then there's this new project, it's called Project Ward, which is a, a project by Google. It's a very exciting because they use this uh, micro SD uh, interface uh for communicating with the host so you can put this uh vault into anything that is operating a micro sd card and uh what the host sees is actually a file system with two files in one file you write in the stuff that you want to encrypt in the other file you read out the stuff that you want to uh that you get back that's all and this whole thing is exposed to you via micro sd uh file system uh, but in the in in the inside you have a, an ARM microprocessor, I guess, that does all the computation and all the cryptographic operations. And the micro SD card is, I guess, uh, fits into most of our smartphones or phones even. Uh, so if you have some kind of application that knows about uh, the word, it can write stuff into this file system, into this file, and get out the encrypted stuff. So it is uh, it is available this functionality to, to all the, the uh, applications running on the device where this MacPad or this uh, microSD is inserted. So the next one is also a, uh, an interesting project. Uh, actually, I didn't write the name. It's called Cryptech. It's done, I guess, mostly by Scandinavian people, but they are all related to the IATF, and their goal is to implement a lot of cryptographic operations in an FPGA and this is the stack that they envision. It's, I'm sorry to, but they want to do crypt, the, the cryptographic operations for DNSSEC, uh, RPKA, PGP, VPN, OTR and, and some other uh, uh, stuff. Uh, this is uh, running in your host but this is already on the CPU, uh, on the smart card, uh, FPGA actually. Uh, it does basically all the very traditional SHA MD5. Actually, MD5 is listed as a hash algorithm here. I don't know. Uh, IES, Camellia. So the selection of the of the cryptographic parameters. I'm not sure. It makes uh, a lot of sense in 2015, but uh, looking at it from a standardization point of view, they still have this legacy stuff that they have to support. So I guess I understand why they still have. Uh, MD5 and, and I guess Camellia in there because of their, they have the standards background. Um, anyway, they get lots of money, uh, but the output, I guess it's so far a lot of, uh, FPGA VHDL code so far as I've seen. Um, there's a, a few good people working on this project that I know personally that also have advised me and helped me on the Pitchfork project. So uh, it will be interesting to see. 
what uh, develops out of this. I'm a bit skeptical because of the standardization approach, but I guess for wide uh, deployment you need that as well. But does it make sense to deploy bugs and broken stuff widely? I don't know. Well, of course, this is. I'm not saying that this is, but it smells a bit. So, and then there's the USB Armory, which is also a very cool device. Um, it is actually a Freescale MX53 uh, processor. Uh, this is a pretty big arm. This is something that you can run your Linux on. So you can plug in a USB thing that runs Linux itself. Eh? So you can do a lot of exciting stuff with that. I don't know what that would be, but this hardware device actually has a feature that I'm very excited about, but apparently so far no one uses it. This is the ARM Trust Zone. So the, uh, in the uh, Intel world, you have the TPMs that have, have the TPM device and protocol implemented as such, mostly in hardware and maybe in some uh, firmware that you cannot change. And then you get that as a ready-made chip or something, and then you communicate with that uh, from your BIOS or your operating system, and then that is uh, handled by that. That is a very ecstatic thing. Uh, the ARM approach is a bit different. ARM said we are going to do a similar, well, we have to provide TPM-like functionalities, but the way we are going to do this, we provide this uh, trust zone in which you can write any code you want. You can implement your TPM the way you want and it will be completely transparent and, uh, I guess, separated from the non-trust zone stuff that is running on the CPU. So it basically, it's, it's like a, a hardware-based vir virtualization where you have uh, one extra virtual machine that is, has co complete control over the complete CPU and everything, every hardware device, but it's completely transparent and invisible from the stuff that is running underneath that. So this is not a software-based uh, virtualization or something. This is really hardware-based and you have one extra virtual uh, domain that has total power and control and the other one is the one that is actually running your user stuff. Yes? If they do compete for cash, I guess they do. I guess they do, yes. They, this is, this, I don't think it's, it's, uh, that deeply, uh, integrated that they have separate cash. I don't know that. That needs to be checked. So this is really exciting because, because you have this one, uh, domain that has complete control that is like ring minus, I don't know, two, one or something. Uh, there's, there's a lot of exciting stuff that you could develop there that is totally isolated from the Linux, the Debian that is running on the main CPU or in the CPU outside of the trust zone. So, um, that is something that definitely should be played with a lot more. So the, the, the drawback with the, the USB armory is the price. It costs 100 euros. Um, for something where I don't know what I'm going to use it for, that's a lot of money. <laughs> um, but if anyone wants to donate me one, please do, I will play with the trust zone. Um, so I think this is a pretty exciting device. And then last, uh, we have the Crypto Cape, which is uh, an extension board. This, this is the extension board for the Beagle Bone Black. And it contains uh, a TPM chip, like I described earlier. It contains some elliptic curve uh, chip that does elliptic curve uh, computations. It does co signing operations, actually. Uh, it does contain an uh, SHA, uh, SHA uh, chip, which does hashing operations, and some write protectable ROM where you, or EPROM where you can store data, and uh, a small, uh, what is that, Atma 384. 48 perhaps, something like that. So, and so it has a, an extra CPU for doing your, your crypto. This is, this is for if you want to, I don't know, maybe on your Arduino or on your BeagleBone or something where you, where you want to play with this, with external hardware. Um, I, I guess you can do your crypto key compartmentalization also into one of these TPM chips. So, um, I think this is also very worth playing with. Because in the end, it's the diversity, and the more people play with this kind of stuff, the the less people play with the stuff that doesn't protect all these keys. Eh? 
So uh, in the end for me the conclusion is that uh, all these tools are really really cool and the diversion is that makes us strong you know in security as well as in biology. Uh, well, Dolly the sheep needs only one virus to kill the whole population but a healthy population with uh, diverse gene pool there will be survivors and they can repopulate so diversity is is really cool and i like also the competition they they do awesome stuff and very inspiring um, and i think there's shitloads of work for all of us for me at least because it doesn't work but also for the others because there's um everyone has 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 stuff where uh, I guess more could be done and I think last but not least maybe it is really true there is crypto wars now again and if it is so then the interesting times will also mean that maybe these kind of devices or the makers and hackers of these kind of devices maybe within one or two years will have uh, a higher need for lawyers than average people <laughs> Um, so um, I hope with the pitchfork itself to have a working version for the camp of course um, I'll be working on that in the next week after this camp uh, I hope that we will find the cause of why it's not running and why it is killing USB ports um, soon so um, I really want to do mass or mass production. I don't know what that means, but um, as soon as I have this working, I, I'm I'm opening up for orders for anyone who wants one. Uh, I'm going to do a bulk order, and you can pay. Uh, of course, it's like crowdfunding, so in advance. But uh, I'm, I don't really like the crowdfunding itself. So this is really just we pull the money for the ordering of these boards. Uh, crowdfunding is is something that someone else does. Well, I have. I don't support or I don't approve very much of crowdfunding anymore. So, in the end, this is my presentation. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. And you can have a look at the boards and the assemblies that I have here. Thank you. Do you have to, to the pitchfork um, and how does it fit kind of into the software ecosystem on, on, your, okay, so, on your PC, like PG and stuff like that? Okay, so the question is how the pitchfork integrates into the workings of the PC, right? Yeah. Uh, when you do your normal task. Okay, yes, that is a very good question. Uh, this is also an offspring that I did not mention, or maybe it's not an offspring, but the grandfather of pitchfork, I don't know. The orders, I don't know. Uh, it's the project is called PBP. Uh, it's a PGP replacement competitor thingy. I'm not sure it should be like taken very seriously, but uh, I have I have this replacement that has also very similar uh, command line switches as PGP. So if a little bit more work would be expended on making the command line switches completely um, compatible with PGP. Then you could simply plug this in, uh, for example, Enigmail, uh, and then you could do your email encryption with a pitchfork, for example. I have the same also implemented uh, for MUT. So in MUT, this already works. Um, like this device as a pitchfork already operates like this so I could uh, uh, encrypt something here and the pitchfork would do the encryption and it go, comes back so this is like the PGP command this is a, like a PGP uh, command line alter ego or something that's how I, I think about being compatible with existing stuff and plugging it in and it works I guess pretty well Is there 
this um, in the home footage, I think there is some smart card support. Yes. Yes. But um, I guess this doesn't really fit your requirements. It, uh, I guess the pitchfork can do more stuff. No, you can code your own stuff on the pitchfork, right? Uh, but there's already implemented stuff uh, existing, of course, yes. But yeah, it does very different. Uh, and a smart card cannot do very fast encryption, right? So with a smart card, you cannot do, for example, that you send all your plain text to the smart card and you get back the ciphertext. With uh, OpenPGP, you actually only send the session key to the smart card, which gets encrypted by the smart card and you get the session key back. And that's much, much smaller than the whole payload, the, the, the whole plain text that you want to encrypt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, the, the question is, that if it has any tamper resistance, or do I plan any feature like this? Uh, currently, no, it does not have any tamper resistance uh, feature. Uh, there, there's one planned. Um, the the plan is that if it is plugged in and hot, hot means that the keys are decrypted in memory. Uh, and you plug it out, this is detected and it clears the memory automatically. So this is not really tamper uh, protection, I guess. But for if it's switched off, there's not much that you can read out because everything is encrypted uh, in, in memory, in the flash memory. So in, in this form, I can give you the key. And if I don't tell you my Guitar Hero sequence, then you will not be able to do anything with this key. So you can lose it and leave, leave it away. This is protected by crypto instead of by tamper resistance. But there is, of course, excellent tamper resistance technology available, but it's, I guess, not yet available to hacker spaces to reproduce themselves. But this is some research that we should get into, maybe. I'm very excited. And the other thing that I also, uh, besides tamper resistance, is of course the other is uh, uh, emissions resistance, right? Or uh, emissions protections, how much uh, it uh, sends out. Um, there I have already measurements, and uh, I have, the, the, the enclosure is also defining, and also the design is made in a way that it should actually already um, reduce emissions. So there's for reducing emissions, you have first of all the FCC and the European regulations that you need to follow. So this is already something that you need to follow, but this is of course not military grade uh, emissions uh, um, um, reduction. Uh, but there's uh, a few documents that you can find online that give you uh, a good idea of what to avoid and how to design such boards so that it minimizes emissions. But I guess this is actually, this is the biggest fun of, of this device, breaking it. There's so many ways you can do it. Uh, it is also very instructive. I'm not saying that this is a device that is uh, giving you 100% security from whatever that means, uh, but it's a device that uh, compartmentalizes your keys, and I, I think it does that pretty well. But if you have like physical access or a forensic team with lots of uh, hardware and chemicals and stuff like that, it will not resist. But that is a very high price uh, to pay for. So, um, but playing with this and developing this and also playing with temper resistance and emissions reductions and all this stuff is something that is, I think, very instructive and will give us a lot more information also for the future. Eh? So not only developing this device, but also breaking the device is both are extremely exciting for me. I, I enjoy both of them. And actually, the breaking is apparently much easier than the making it work. <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. So when I, get, when, I, when I generate keys on this, where do, where do I get the random uh, bits? The answer is um, from the hardware. 
uh, actually the 205 of this CPU that I use uh, has an embedded RNG, uh, which is a ring oscillator uh, setup, which I just found, and this is the exciting part of breaking it again, I just found a paper from 2002, which is about breaking this kind of hardware random number generator. So if I find some time, I will uh, try this paper on this hardware random number generator and try to break it. Uh, will be very exciting. I don't know how feasible that is. Uh, so I have this random hardware random number generator which generates 32 bits of uh, randomness every 42 uh, clock cycles. So it's not instantaneous. It takes some time uh, to gather more entropy. Uh, this is one of the entropy sources that I have. This is the biggest entropy source that I have. The other entropy sources that I have are the two internal analog digital converters that are in the CPU. One is a temperature sensor for the internal temperature of the CPU, and the other one is the internal voltage uh, sensor. And both of them, according to the spec, if you read the, uh, the specification, it says to get the most accurate uh, readings, you need to follow this procedure. So I do exactly the opposite, so I get the most inaccurate readings, and by this I actually get a few bits of entropy in each of these ADCs. And I did measurements on that, and the output was, uh, with, if I completely calibrate uh, both of these ADCs, then I get about one bit of entropy by reading that, but if I miscalibrate the whole device, and say, if it says, you need to calibrate it here like this, and I do exactly the opposite, then I get about, in the case of the temperature sensor, 4.3 bits of entropy out of 8 bits. That is pretty cool. And for the, for the voltage sensor, I get 3.2 bits of entropy. Uh, so on every reading, I get a few bits of entropy. And these are three sources that are, I guess, uh, the best that I have. And these are mixed uh, into, into the same mixing and whitening and random and uh, gathering uh, and pooling algorithm that is used in the Linux kernel since last year. Last year there was like a review and some bugs found in the in the random and random uh, or in the generation of that. And after those have been fixed, I used that code and ported it to the ARM. And so basically what is now, I have the random number generator, I have these two misconfigured ADCs, and they are getting in into the entropy pool, and the entropy pool outputs uh, the, the random numbers in the end. And the implementation in the middle is basically the Linux kernel, part, uh, like the, the one part, the, the function that collects the, and, and mixes the entropy. <laughs> would be nice, yes, would be really nice, and also doing this whole... If you would like to certify this, then maybe... I don't want to certify this. I I have... Those, this is not the kind of customer that I envision. I, I, I intend to starve by this on this project, <laughs> not get rich. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>